Now, this sermon can apply to parents who need to depend on a child to take care of them for something. Or a child depends on a parent to guide and help them and support them on something. This sermon can apply to a lover depending on a fellow husband or a wife in time of need. This sermon can apply to a member who is depended upon by the pastor to take care of the service or run things effectively. This can be a leader of a certain group, whether it be a business or a ministry, where they are dependent on a certain worker to help them out, to make sure they fulfill their duty, their job correctly, whether it be kitchen, nursery, uh, the job that you're working in, etc., or basically anybody in life that you know of that depends on you. So if you are that person, then this sermon applies to you, which I know applies to everybody. So you have to understand that in order to be a dependable person, and you're going to have people who depend on you to do so, you have to understand that accountability, that weight. And I want you to understand that as I cover this message. All right, the title of my message today is, Are You Dependable or Expendable? Are You Dependable or Expendable? Now, if you're going to be the expendable type of person, it's basically one that's just wasted away and tossed out. You might volunteer and be used to help out something, but then eventually you're tossed away. Why? Because you're unreliable. You're not someone they can depend upon to take care of something, whether to preach on this pulpit, whether to teach a class, whether to guide a family, whether to lead something important in the ministry. And you have to understand that you don't want to be the expendable person. I know that there are people in this church, every one of you, want to be the dependable person, not the expendable. You want to be someone that they can rely on, they can trust, and they can take this ministry seriously. The problem with people nowadays is that people don't take life seriously. They don't take their family seriously. They don't take their job seriously. They don't take people that they're in charge of. You're talking about people's lives here. They don't take them seriously. And especially if you're in charge of their souls, you're not taking that job seriously. Especially when you're in charge of souls. And when you go on this pulpit, it's not something, oh, I want to do this. No, you need to take this seriously. And that's why you have to watch your life and to make sure that you repent of things, that there's some flaws in your life so that you can be dependable to people. Otherwise, you're just going to be an expendable, someone that people don't bother to use and they just toss you aside. You don't want to be that type of person. If you feel that way expendable, then you need to contemplate on this message and see if this is something that applies to you. So let's bow. Pray along with me, please, all right? We need God. Heavenly Father, please fill within me the power of your Holy Spirit. Wash away my sins with your holy blood. Fill within me, Lord. Help me to preach the way you want me to preach. Uh, Father, I'm, I've yielded, I've trusted, and I've prayed. And all I can do now is just go by how you lead me. Help me to go by your leading. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Now, my first point, let's look at Colossians chapter 4 and verse 7. The first point is dependable people are selfless. Dependable people are selfless. Let's look at verse 7. All my state shall Tychicus declare unto you, who is a beloved brother and a faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord, whom I have sent unto you for the same purpose, that he might know your estate and comfort your hearts. Paul gives a list of people he depended upon to take care of his ministry. And some of you might be wondering, how I want to be that person. The Apostle Paul, I want to be his asset. I want to be his helper. I want to be the one that even the great Apostle Paul would rely upon. Well, if you want to know that, then look at this first point right here is a selfless person named Tychicus. Never thought about himself. Thought about other people. What can I do to be a blessing to other people? To comfort them. To take care of them. 
Not the person that says, I need a person to comfort me. I need a person to take care of me. I need a person to help me out in something. And if you're that person, then you're not a dependable person. Imagine a leader, a leader in the church who preaches and teaches on the pulpit or anybody who's in charge of a class or anybody who preaches and teaches the word of God. Imagine they're the one that comes to you and say, hey, I need this from you or I need that from you or you do this for me and I do that for you. No, a lot of people when they come to this church, what do they expect? They expect the person to give you something, to comfort you, to help you, to serve you. This is a position. This is a position where you become a selfless person and you give to other people. People expect the pastor to counsel them, to help them out, to call them, to be there for them, to be here early, to help out and stuff, to organize, even though I'm not in charge of the kitchen or the tech or the Sunday school, nevertheless, they expect me to lead and guide. And dependability works vice versa too. It's not just members depending on the pastor. The pastor depends on the members too. What? That they will be there in the kitchen. They will be there in Sunday school. They will be there in tech. That they will be there to help out. If you want to be a dependable person, then you have to be completely selfless and not expect, hey, I want so-and-so or the pastor or somebody else to help me out. No, if you want to be dependable, I want to help the pastor out. I want to help the church member out. I want to help them out. But if uh, you know how to be expendable, I'll tell you how to be expendable. Hey, I need this for something. Can you, can you help me out on this one? Hey, you know, uh, why don't you show me enough love? Why aren't you friendly toward me? Why don't you be the one that shows love to the person? Why don't you be the one that befriends other people? Why do we have to be the one to come to you? Hey, you know, I expected so-and-so to be here early to set up this stuff. Why don't you be the one? Why are you expecting somebody else to do it? And I know what's going on in people's mind. Automatically, they're thinking about somebody's name, somebody else. You're not thinking about yourself. And if that's you right now, you're expendable. Are you truly thinking about yourself here? Don't think about other people in the church. Think about yourself. What am I the one? Am I the one that's comforting, supporting, helping out, being there? That's how you become a dependable person. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 32 through 33 says, Give none offense, neither to the Jews, nor to the Gentiles, nor to the church of God, even as I please all men in all things, not seeking mine own profit, but the profit of many that they may be saved. That's what the Apostle Paul is pointing out. A dependable person is one who tries not to offend other people. Now, if you just come in as you are nonchalantly with uh, the kind of personality that you have, well, that's just how I am. Hey, does it offend somebody? Are you uh, pleasing the other person with your personality? Well, that's just how I am. They have to put up with me. See, that's your problem. You're expecting them to show love with, to you, patience with you. You're not the one shedding patience toward them, love toward them. You're expendable. And one day, you're going to be the person... And it's not that pastor or members deliberately shun you out or kick you out. No, you kicked out yourself. You'll notice the people who become more isolated, 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 less involved, less involved, and attend less, fewer, fewer services, and eventually they don't come back. They toss themselves out. They became expendable. It's not the church people. It's not the pastor. And it's not the Lord. It's you. If that's your personality, you need to change that. You need to repent of it. Well, that's just uh, my conviction, how I am. And they just have to put up. If they don't like it, then, then what? Huh? You want to be tossed out? You want to be expendable? Or are you going to respect other people's spiritual convictions? And are you thinking about so-and-so right now or yourself? See, it's so easy to think about so-and-so. Yeah, that's right, and amen, and no, yourself. You're expendable then if you automatically thought about someone else. You need to think about yourself and think about what kind of convictions that you have that have burdened other people in the church. You know, praise the Lord, we didn't, uh, with this ring around the rosy, with the stupid restrictions going on nowadays, we don't have people trying to enforce their spiritual conviction on another person. But you know what? 
there may have been some people doing that on other people and have unnecessarily pressured them and burdened them. And you got to realize then you bought it, better watch yourself. You're an expendable person in the church. You're not dependable. They won't, uh, you're not the person that they would rely upon to help out with a spiritual advice or spiritual help because they know your conviction would burden them, would offend them and push them away. Your liberty, you know, well, that's just how I am, right? Well, that just, uh, you know, the Bible never condemned that, so I can just come in the way that I'm dressed. I can talk the way that I talk. I can act the way that I act. There's nothing in the Bible that condemned it. So why are you guys judging me? And see, you know what you are? You're expendable. You're not dependable. A dependable person is where your liberty and freedom that God allows doesn't hurt and burden other people. You know what, what I have the freedom to do? I have the freedom and I have the liberty to not come here early all the time. I know of Bible-believing pastors who don't come early. They have their other members doing it for them. I have the liberty to do that, but guess what? I come here early. Why? Because I don't want to hurt. I don't want to burden people because people are following my example to come in early. You know what a selfish person is? He's also the type of person that tries to attack, attract attention to himself. You ever see these type of people? You know, why, why are you the one? Uh, I, I, I've had some of those people. Oh, they became expendable. They don't last in this church long. I've seen the person, where are you going to ask me to lead soul winning? Where are you going to ask to... Where are you going to ask me to lead preaching? Where are you going to ask me to lead Sunday school class? Where are you going to ask me to teach? I got a really good teaching, etc. They become expendable soon. You know, why do you want to do that? Oh, I want to attract attention. I want to, you want to be what? I want to be a great model for Jesus Christ that people look up to. No, you just want attention to yourself. You don't want to give glory to Jesus. Giving glory to Jesus is being humble, having no attention whatsoever, and just helping out and just setting up chairs. And then somebody else getting the attention when they preach or teach on the pulpit. Amen. Why? Because it's all about Jesus Christ, not about you. Amen. See, you become a selfish person, not selfless. Selfless people are dependable. Selfless. No attention, no credit whatsoever. They become the most ignored, and yet they help out the church. You prioritize other people's desires above yourself. That's the bottom line in being a selfless person. Well, she did this, and he did this, and pastor said this, and church member so-and-so did this. Deacon said this. Somebody's wife mentioned that to me, and their ch kid mentioned that to me. No, 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 no. Hey, hey, hey. Uh, are you thinking about their desires or yours? That's why church fights always happen. You know why? You're not thinking about the, person's, the other person's desire, what he or she wants. That's what a selfless person does. They let them win something win the conversation win the day win the leading and you're the one that becomes defeated or something hey that's a selfless person Amen. a selfish person is i want to be the one who wins in everything the conversation and the leadership and life and arguing and you try doing that when you get married let's see how happy your spouse would be Amen. that's not how you live you prioritize other people's desires above yourself. And when you do that, then you become relied upon, dependent upon to take care of things. Amen. I want to help out the church. I want to help out in this and that and that. How you do it is you're selfless. Don't think about yourself. Think, think about other people. Think about other people, what you can do for them. They're the person who makes an attempt. In that passage that I read from Paul, they try to please all men. They make an attempt. If you're the type that attracts attention to the self, you know what you try to do? Try to not gain attention at all. You don't mention about yourself. You try to give attention to other people, how great, they're, uh, how great they are, what good things they did. If you're the type of person who's not selfish but, selfless, uh, but selfless, you're not letting your liberty or your conviction burden the other people. No, what you do is you sacrifice your own, you restrain yourself, whether your liberty or your conviction, to prioritize the other person. What edifies him or her? What makes him or her happy? Well, I don't believe in doing that. That's why you're not going to have a happy marriage. I guarantee there are people who live like that. If you're married, 
or unmarried, you're very unhappy. If you're the type of person who's completely selfless and not selfish in trying to win an argument and trying to do things your way and then the person hurts you on something and no, no, what you do is try, did you ever try to make peace? Don't justify yourself. Everyone justifies themselves when they go through a tension or an argument. No, 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 no. You don't try to do that. You don't brush it off. You don't justify yourself. You're not, see, you're thinking about yourself here when you justify. You, 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 you. You're not thinking about the other person. Aren't you trying to make peace? Do you try to make peace? Hey, uh, hey, hey I, I don't, I don't want to argue. I don't want to fight. What can, we, what can I do to make this peaceful? You ever do that? Do you uh, sacrifice your own desire for other people? Sacrifice. Yes, it's called sacrifice. Sacrifice means it hurts. You know what sacrifice is? You cut the throat of the lamb. It hurts. You know what sacrifice is? You let it bleed on the ground and hit the dirt. That hurts. You know what sacrifice is? Jesus Christ being nailed on a cross. That hurts. And yes, it's supposed to hurt when you do somebody what somebody else wants to do rather than what you like to do. Then you're a dependable person. Then you're called upon. Then you're relied upon to do things in the church, to lead or even help out people. Dependable people are so selfless, they find ways to be a blessing, not a burden. Are you, are you finding ways to bless or are you just come in as you are when you come to church? Or do you find ways, what can I do? As soon as you walk in, do you think about, what can I do to make the pastor, the pastor's wife, the person sitting next to me, the people in the kitchen, the people in Sunday school class, or the quiet person who doesn't get much attention and seems isolated, what can I do to be a blessing to that person? Do you think about that? Do you think about that? If not, if you're the guy that's on the receiving end, yeah, that's right, uh, you treat me, you help me out, then see, you're not the dependable person. You're the expendable. The second point is dependable people are steadfast. Dependable people are steadfast. Let's look at verse 9, verse 9 of Colossians 4. With Onesimus, a faithful and beloved brother, who is one of you, they shall make known unto you all things which are done here. Notice that the Word of God points out at verse 9 that Onesimus, that he stood, he's faithful. He's going to make sure that the people in the church knows everything about what's going on in Paul's ministry. He's steadfast. He's rely upon, relied upon. Are you that kind of person? 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58 says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. I find it so interesting that when Paul says a person is steadfast in doing God's work, it says steadfast, unmovable, always together. Paul thinks those three words are synonymous. Steadfast, that means to hold fast then. Hold on. Then what does not steadfast mean? Simple, you don't hold on. Are there times that you did let go a little bit? Well, I was steadfast. And no, you let go once. You let go a couple times. You let it slip a bit. Automatically, that doesn't mean steadfast. Steadfast is always unmovable. Steadfast. But you've been moved. Why? Because of a trial. Because of an attack. Because of suffering. Because of some problem here and there going on in the church. Because of your convenience. You moved. You let go. You're not holding fast. Think about it. You know, how, uh, you know who dependable people are? Dependable people are those who confidently and know and expect so-and-so will be there to take care of the tech. So-and-so will work hard and preach an effective message that day. So-and-so will be there and come to me and welcome me and fellowship with me and be there for me when I need him or her. So the, you, know what, uh, you know what a dependable person is? That's a steadfast person. Why? Because they faithfully kept doing those good things. So then they became dependent upon by other people saying, hey, I know that so-and-so will be there for me. 
I know that it's, it's just like so-and-so to tell me that I'm praying for you. It's just like so-and-so to come up to me, even though I'm trying to hide in the corner, that so-and-so will just find me and come to me and say, welcome to our church. It's just like so-and-so to preach a great message and to teach a good teaching that day. It's just like so-and-so to just be so much of encouragement, not a burden. No, no, the type, uh, that's being faithful, unmovable, helping out other people. But uh, you think that these people will be relied upon when you know that, oh yeah, I don't know if so-and-so will be there on time. I don't know if so-and-so is going to preach a good message that day. I don't know if so-and-so is going to go over time again. Guilty. <laughs> I don't know if so-and-so is going to teach something that's just going to be so sloppy. I don't know if so-and-so is going to come and cause a little tension in the church service or in fellowship because the way he or she talks and the way he or she acts and is so inconsiderate and says stuff and does stuff that really burdens me. You think that's a dependable person? Who are the people, let's make this simple, who are the people, the top five people that the congregation can confidently expect to do a good job in the church? Isn't that simple? Then you know why they, the congregation relies on those people. Why would they pick those five? Because they were faithful in every time they attended church and how they preached how they teach, how they welcome people, how they didn't be a burden to people, how they weren't acting weird or strange, and that they took this ministry seriously, they weren't joking around or clowning around, and that they would dress properly and just act properly. They just make it a proper, serious worship service for the Lord that ministers people, and they take their job seriously. Is that you, honestly? Are, do you fit the top five in the list? Do you think the congregation is going to pick you? You know why they won't pick you. You're not faithful. You're not steadfast. You know what you are? You're expendable, just used and tossed aside, and then let's move on to the next person. Is that how you feel? You know, in Acts chapter 15, there's a great passage where John Mark, because he wasn't there for Paul, Paul says, no, I don't want him in my ministry. And Barnabas, he was being the more gracious, charitable brother. No, let's bring John Mark. We can encourage him. He can help us out in the work. And then Paul's like, no, 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 I don't want him. Barnabas says to Paul, but John Mark, he only, you know, the ministry was too tough for him, Paul. You understand that it was hard for him. That's why he wasn't there for us that time. But this time he'll be there. Paul's like, no, I can't have him. And Barnabas is like, it was just one time, Paul. Come on, give it a break. It's just one time. Why do you make it a big deal? And Paul said, no, I can't trust him. See, that's the thing. You can't trust even if it's just one time. Why? John Mark wasn't holding fast. It was just one time. What a big deal that was. It's not a big deal. One time's enough that uh, I can't really trust that person yet. Well, I repented and I got right. John Mark did too. Paul couldn't trust him. Simple. It takes only one scandal uh, from the pastor. If there was a money scandal or a sex scandal, that's more than enough where people don't depend on the pastor. You got to understand the weight and your responsibility as you serve the Lord, and help out the church. Are you dependable or are you expendable? No, I can't trust so-and-so with bringing this item to church anymore because so-and-so, that's going to happen. They're not holding fast. No, I can't depend upon so-and-so to be there to help out in the tech and guide the tech because that one time I cannot trust. I can't trust so-and-so to be there to preach and to teach, to take care of the service because of that one time where it happened. They weren't faithful. They weren't dedicated. Steadfast. Now look, I'm not telling you to be so nitpicky and so hard on people. People make mistakes. Look, I'm so happy. Thank you so much for being gracious with this, Pastor. I made mistakes. And I don't mean just one. I made tons of mistakes. 
But you know, the thing is, it doesn't change the fact, and you can agree with me, is that if I was not steadfast as much as I am now, okay, with my mistakes, I made tons of mistakes, but I try to be steadfast, but imagine if I went even lower, if I wasn't as steadfast, if I wasn't dedicated, if I wasn't faithful, would you trust me to pastor this church in COVID-19 situation online where the whole world wants to crucify us and the person who's of a young age to guide, to lead, and to counsel? You wouldn't if you found something, right, that you didn't trust me in. Think about yourself then. Think about yourself with that kind of weight. My third point is dependable people are supportive. Dependable people are supportive. If you look at verses 10 through 11, notice the support that these people give. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, saluteth you. And Marcus, sister, son to Barnabas, touching whom ye receive commandments. And if he come unto you, receive him. And Jesus, which is called Justice, who are of the circumcision. These only are my fellow workers unto the kingdom of God, which have been a comfort unto me. Isn't it interesting to show that Paul mentions all these people, people's names, who were fellow workers and who supported the Apostle Paul that he would name them. Would, would your name be the one that Jesus Christ would name as this is the person that I depend upon to take care of San Jose Bible Baptist Church? Ephesians 4.16 says, From whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. The Bible talks about the whole body, it supports each other. Every joint supplieth and then increases to the edification where everybody loves each other, where everybody helps out each other. Would you say that that's the kind of person you are, that you created that kind of environment through your support? Are you that type of supportive person that a person will feel like, I know when, I, when so-and-so is going to be there at church that we're going to have a good time. I know that when so-and-so is there in that church, we're going to have something spiritual happen. I know when so-and-so is in church that time that the food's going to be set up right, and the house is going to be arranged right. And the room is going to be arranged right. The church is going to be arranged right. Or is it all just depending on the pastor? Then you're not dependable. And the pastor is the only one that's dependable? That's not how it should be. The pastor shouldn't be the only one supporting the members. The members should support each other. Especially when, God forbid, something bad happens to the pastor. Do you know what support means? Some of us don't know what support means. It means to vindicate, which means clear from blame, to maintain, to defend successfully as to be able to support one's own cause. See, that's the, oh, the, from the definition of support, it's maintaining them. Are you the type of person that maintains people? You know, sometimes they get some people might think that, well, pastor, you're just going the extra mile for so-and-so. No, 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 that's my job. It's to support the person. It's to maintain that person in the right path to serve the Lord and to prevent them from falling. Are you keeping an eye on those type of people in the church? Or do you go around with your own selected friends? You know what the problem with people are? You know, they hang around their selected individuals. They choose to fellowship with them, go along with them. Or go in a room with them, go on along with the ride with them, spend time in dinner with them, but not with all the brethren in the church. You're not a dependable person, you're expendable. An expendable person is, I want the people to meet me, to, to make me feel good, and I want to choose which people that I like to fellowship with. Those are nitpicky people, they're very expendable. They don't want you, they, you're the last person they call upon, you're definitely expendable. A dependable person is, no, 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 not about people maintaining me. I want to maintain them. 
And I want to keep an eye out for the people who are about to fall. I want to keep an eye out for the people who are struggling. I want to keep an eye out for the people who are having a hard time. I want to keep an eye out for the people who are usually quiet and silent. I want to maintain them. I want to help them out. And yeah, maybe the brother or the sister has a few screws loose and maybe have some problems here and there and they don't meet my cup of tea. They're not my level. It's kind of awkward when I'm around them. But it's not about me. It's about him or her. And that's support. That's support. And what happens is then you're the per Those are the type of people who get really popular in parties. Don't you know that? Those are the people who get very popular that people would want to vote for, for president. Those are the type of people that uh, get a lot of friends and acquaintances. They're the life of the party, so to speak. That's why leaders do that. Why? They keep an eye out for everybody so that every vote and love and support counts for them. It benefits them. But they do it for power. That's their problem. They do it for power. Nevertheless, it does show something very important here. Supporting each and every person is that valuable. That even lost wicked people who have an agenda realize that. And they realize it better than you. You know, the verse that I read to you about the body of Christ supporting each other and, and maintaining each other. I mentioned the definition of support, right? It also means to justify, clear from blame. Now, the problem with churches nowadays, the number one problem, and this is the number one sin that uh, you got to realize that churches take seriously the most, believe it or not. And that is the sin of the tongue, gossip. They take action disciplinary, disciplinary measures fast on that one. There's something you don't want to mess up in. It's this one. And I'm not talking about the sin of sodomy. And I'm not talking about the sin of fornication. I'm talking about the sin of the tongue. Some people get so pharisaical and yet, yeah, that's disgusting. That's so evil and wicked, that scandal, that they don't look at their tongue. And that's gossip. And that thing is so horrible. How are you supporting a brother and sister in Christ when you talk back? To a person. You think you're a dependable person when you talk back? Can you help me out on this? Can you prevent yourself from doing this? Can you be more of a blessing in this? And then blah, 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 blah. Then you talk back. No, no, that's just how I am. This is what I do. And no, you don't understand how I... You know what that is? You're not a dependable person. You're the pe person that they would spend the least time upon for fellowship. Are you the type of person that whispers like shh, shh, shh. you talk you talk bad about certain people in the church and you have your clique, your group of people and you mention so and so and you talk about somebody in the church. And then you come in all hypocritical in the church pretending that you love when you don't. What is that whispering for? Critical spirit, you know, like nitpicky, nitpicky about so and so being this way and that way. And trust me, it's not going to be one person. It's going to grow to two to three other people That's right. that you're going to nitpick and critique and find pointers. And that thing is such an infection, worse than any COVID-19 thing or pandemic. And it's so horrible, you're going to pretty soon pick out and nitpick the pastor, how he leads right, yeah. and preach right. and teach. And then it's so bad, you're going to do that even in your own household in your own life, that you can't live happy. Here's the food. Why, enjoy the food. No, no, this is not my cup of tea. This is not my food, and I want something else. I want you to take me someplace else, or I want this kind of food. Mommy, daddy, I don't like this food. Child, children, that's why they act up like that. House, you know, oh, you know, this is not my residence, and then you're going to be so nitpicky, and good luck in this Bay Area. That you find no place to live. That's what happens. It affects your life, your joy, that pretty soon you might be without food and without a shelter and you're just all by yourself. This is a car that I don't like and I don't want to drive this vehicle. This is not my cup of tea. Then go without a car. And by the way, when you go without a car, then you're going to be the nitpicky person on, I want so-and-so to take care of me and bring me to church. Or I want enough money for my Uber and Lyft so that I can have a nicer vehicle. Or I want 
Pretty soon you're going to be the guy that wants a nice vehicle and then you're going to reject every Uber and Lyft that's nearby and then you're just going to be wasting one hour to get your ride and paying extra money. It affects your life like a poison. See, what happens with that critical spirit when you don't support people, then it affects your own life, your own living, and you become unhappy. You know what I do with people who, uh, the brethren in the church? You got to watch out for that tongue. I keep it shut, even people that I took disciplinary measures with. I just keep it between me and that person. Why? I, I just hate this thing. It just goes around like an infection. Amen. Nobody's business. That's it. So even with people that I rebuke, I just keep it low profile as much as possible. I just hate this gossip thing. What do you do with the people? Well, if a person points out a legitimate problem with another person, you know what I try to do? I try to say, you know, shed, let's shed a little bit more grace with that person. Shed a little bit more charity. Let, let's be patient. It takes time. I mean, it was the same thing with me and you too, right, brother, sister? And they'll go, yeah, you're right, so... Don't I talk like that? Don't some of you know what I'm talking about? Amen. I do that. But what I try to do is, well, you got to understand so-and-so where he or she came from. The person is just like that. And then, you know, let the Lord deal with him or her. Or I'll say, or I'll give the, the accused the benefit of the doubt. I'll say, hey, maybe so, uh, before we talk bad about the person, so-and-so is going through this and that and that. And maybe that's why so-and-so did that. Good preaching. Yeah, good preaching. Amen. Amen. That's, you know what the expendable people are? Blah, blah about so-and-so, and guess what? Then pretty soon you come to a point which is so sad and such a bad infection in Bible-believing churches, you get Bible-believing pastors saying, you know what, I'm thankful for a church split. Yeah. You know that? You never heard enough preaching? They'll say when church splits happen, it's a good thing. We get rid of the troublemakers. Why? They're the ones that, they're expendable. Blah, 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 blah. You know what I do with those people? I just surrender them to the Lord. I say, Lord, you handle the person. Lord, you give me wisdom on how to show charity, to be patient with the person. Amen. Why? I'm supportive of the brethren in the church. Until you cross a line where you hurt the church, where you hurt God's people, that's when I cut you off. Amen. That's when I go land on you on all fours. And some of you see me do that, and it's not fun, all right? But you see me how I would support the person. I'll say, just be patient. Just wait. Just pray for the person. Just let the Lord deal with them. I don't, but when you cross a line, I'm going to, uh, you don't want to mess with me on that one when, I, when you cross the line. But until you don't reach that line, I'm going to support you as much as I can. Amen. I'm going to bear myself to the bone for that one, even if I don't like you. You know why? You're my brother and sister in Christ, and we're supposed to support each other. And that's why those same people can depend on me. I know that person's not going to talk bad about me. And I know when that person rebukes me, they're doing it because he or she loves me. Thank you, Pastor. Do they, are you that kind of a dependable person? That even when you rebuke the person, that they listen to you and heed to your advice? I wonder why they don't. There's something about you that drives them away from you. Maybe you haven't supported them one time before. Thought about that? When's the last time you supported somebody? Cleared them from blame, defended them, gave them the benefit of the doubt. My fourth point is dependable people are spirited. Dependable people are spirited. In verses 12 through 13 of Colossians chapter 4, we see Epaphras, who uh, was a servant of Christ, laboring fervently, and he's been praying for them perfect, complete in the will of God. Verse 13, he has a great zeal for them. Dependable people are those who are very spirited and who carry the extra mile of dependability. Oh, you know, uh, kitchen, Sunday school, stuff like that. I've done my job. If you're that type of person, you're not dependable. I've done what pastor asked me to do. No, you're not then you're dependable on a normal level. Real dependable people are those who are spirited. What happens with people who are spirited? A pastor uh, asked me to take care of games, and you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to call him like a week prior and let him know what kind of games we're going to lead for the kids. I'm spirited to do that. The tech, we always have problems. I'm so spirited that I'm going to 
save up money and buy more equipment. I'm going to get here early. I'm going to make sure there's zero issues. I'm going to make a checklist that's like infallible pretty much and make sure there are no problems. I'm going to pray up. I'm going to pray up before the night before and make sure that the Lord keeps those devils away from the tech. That's good, brother. Those are dependable people. Of course, then the pastor would ask that person to take care of tech all the time to take care of Sunday school class all the time and lead the games for the kids. You know who dependable people are? They, they're not just the normal themselves, complete the normal duties. They carry the extra mile. Well, you know, that's just how I am. You know, I, I, why are you telling me, uh, what are you telling me to do? You know, to be happy all the time, to be like so energetic when I come to church and be like Brother Jonathan, hey, let's go church, triple amen. You know, what are you expecting me to do, Pastor? I'm not telling you to do all that kind of stuff, but I'm telling you not to be the normal you either. Well, that's just how I am. No, no, that's just not how you are. If you go the way how you normally are in your flesh, what's the end result of the way you normally live in your flesh? I know that is in me and my flesh dwelleth no good thing. Amen. You always have to fix that flesh. That flesh, even if it, in its normal days, normal personality, what you are, burden somebody in the church. And what you thought wasn't sin became sin later on. Do you know what I'm talking about? It's like a person, for example, who jokes, you know, that's just normally he or she is. But then what happens is when you carry, keep going on with your joking, it becomes soon a sin where there's a serious time going on and a serious request from a person in the church in a serious moment, and then you're just joking and laughing about it. Why? Because that's your character. That's how you, who you are. But that was such a wrong timing. And that those were the wrong people that you did. And people think, this guy don't take his job seriously. Amen. You can't be the normal you. You have to fix yourself. You have to fix uh, yourself in a way that aren't you passionate and spirited on, I want to change myself in a way that will be a blessing to the people in the church. Amen. That people can depend upon, rely upon. Amen. Are you passionate and so spirited that, hey, I'm going to do the extra mile. I'm going to, I know Brother Max told me to bring one utensil. I'm going to bring 10 utensils. <laughs> I know Brother Max told me to bring a meal. I'm going to bring two meals. I know pastor told me to come at this time. I'm going to come 30 minutes more early. I'm going to be just as annoying as Daniel Seeley and say, I'll carry four heaters and a keyboard, and then, you know, I'll go pick up food for you, pastor, and I'll carry the tech too. Amen. Those are the spirited people who become so dependable that, sadly, they've even been taken advantage of. And I just want to say this, all right? Uh, Poor Danielle Seeley, that did happen. She carried all of that. Now she became so dependable, some of you sadly took advantage of her. Please don't do that. Please don't do that. Uh, we got to help each other out. You got to be dependable, not expendable. Why? It's just how we normally do things, Pastor. How we set up, how we do things. That's just how I am. This is how we are. San Jose Bible Baptist Church. No, that's not who we are. Who we are is I want to be more like Jesus Christ. Amen. I think I, I, think I uh, got something from the preaching when I was away, right? <laughs> I, carried, I may have carried something with me. Verse 17. Verse 17. And say to Archippus, take heed to the ministry which thou hast received in the Lord, that thou fulfill it. Now notice right here that uh, Paul relied on Archippus to take care of the ministry, that he would do a good job. Why? Because dependable people are settled. He's going to complete the task. He's going to be grounded. He's going to be settled. Are you that type of person? Are you settled? He settled in his conviction right here. He received of the Lord in verse 17. Whatever that conviction that Vernon was, he was going to do it. You know who people are who really are dependable people in the church? And I've seen this in my church. The people who settled in their conviction for the Lord. It's usually after a summer camp or a blowout for some strange reason. They receive something for, from the Lord like Archippus. And then they come to me and say, Hey, pastor, from now on, I'm not going to skip a Sunday. I get some of those people who tell me that. 
I get some people who tell me, hey, pastor, from now on, I'm not going to be struggling with this anymore. I'm going to do this for the church. And then guess what? They meant it. They were settled. Why? They had a strong conviction from the Lord that they received, and they grounded themselves in it. And that's why they became dependent upon. You know why you onliners dependent upon me? Why you people in the church dependent upon me? You know that I'm not going to budge. That I'm settled. That I hate higher intellectualism and evil wickedness that takes advantage of people's souls. And I don't care how unpopular or how much you hate me. You ain't going to budge this guy from preaching the truth to you and wearing himself out into giving you the whole truth and nothing but the truth. So help me, God. Amen. And I'm going to give you from the word of God, and you know that, and that's not going to budge me. Amen. I'm locked, and I don't care how many nasty comments I get online, yeah. how many people hate me or walk away from the middle of my teaching and preaching. You know what I'm settled in? I'm going to stick to God, Amen. and you know that from me. Amen. So that's why you depend on me. Are you settled? Do you have a conviction? That's why I didn't quit the ministry so far. I mean, I'm weak. I don't want to say I'm awesome. I'm weak. I mean, I don't know why you would depend upon me. I could have fallen too many times, to be honest. Too many times. But, you know, I, ha I did have something that at least kept me going. I was settled in my conviction. I can't picture myself wearing skinny jeans and having electric guitar with pink clouds in the church service. It makes me throw up. I'd sooner die than do that. Amen. Why? I'm grounded. I'm settled. Amen. Do you have that kind of conviction, that strong conviction? And then that, what happens is then people depend upon you. Amen, well, people criticize me. They make fun of me. My family... They make fun of me every time that I'm settled that I'm not going to take a drink of that liquor. No, you know, trust me, they'll make fun of you, they'll criticize you, but they'll depend upon you one day. That's right. Amen. You might say, no, they won't. Yeah, they're going to respect you. This guy is not going to cheat in work because he's settled. He told me he's not going to cheat in work. I saw how he pays his bill. I saw how he gives so much in tithe and offering. I've seen this person. Oh, I know that person, even though he's not drinking, I'm going to depend on him. Why? When you're the drunken person in the party, who are you going to rely upon to take you home safe? Is that Christian right there? You take me home. People, they're going to depend on you when you're settled in your conviction on something because they know you're that person no matter what. Deuteronomy chapter 3, verse 21 through 22. I want you to turn to Deuteronomy 3, and let's wrap it up here. Thank you for your patience. Good Thank you for your patience. Thank you so much. I know you don't depend upon me for the time, but you depend upon me for the preaching. So I can at least say thank you so much for that one. All right, I will wrap it up here, all right? We started out late, so... That's the reason why it took a little longer, so I apologize. Let me wrap this up, all right? Deuteronomy chapter 3, and then we'll look at verse 21. Now, what, what did God tell Moses? Moses had to depend on someone. Who was it? It was a Joshua. And this Joshua, at verse 21, the Bible says, And I commanded Joshua at that time, saying, Thine eyes have seen all that the Lord your God hath done unto these two kings. So shall the Lord do unto all uh, the kingdoms whither thou passest. Uh, fear, ye shall not fear them, for the Lord your God, he shall fight for you. Now notice right here that God says that, hey, I commanded Joshua that he's going to conquer these kingdoms and that he's going to lead the children of Israel. Why is Joshua dependent upon to take care of a million people ministry? Talk about a ministry to depend upon. You're entrusting a lot to take, on a person to take care of a million people. Imagine the pastor trusting you with this number in the church or the subscribers online and that you won't ruin your testimony and that you'd help out the church, you'd be there on time, and that you'd be supportive and you'd be there. That's a lot to ask when the pastor asks of you. But imagine a million people. Now, why is Joshua dependent upon such a large responsibility? You didn't read verse 26 through 28. You'll notice at verse 
28. But charge Joshua and encourage him and strengthen him, for he shall go over before this people. I'll tell you why Moses can trust Joshua, because God told Moses, I trust Joshua. So you have Joshua in charge. And that's the ultimate thing. You know why you're not a dependable person in the church? Simple, you're not dependable to God. God don't trust you to preach on this pulpit. God don't trust you to teach. God don't trust you to lead certain people. God don't trust you to pray for some brother and sister. God don't trust you to come to this church and help out. God don't trust you to help out the kitchen. God don't trust you to help out the Sunday school class. God don't trust you to be just simply, even a simple thing, just being a blessing to some brother or sister and not just selected people you want to choose. God don't trust you. Until God trusts you, then other people will start trusting you. You might say, why is that? Because I had to, I'm still working on it. I don't know why God would entrust me with this ministry, right? That's huge. This is huge. So huge at my age. The Bay Area? We're in two locations now, God put me, entrusted me with. The online ministry? More importantly than all of this, it's you God entrusted. God entrusted me to take care of you. I don't know why. I don't know why. What God found in me to trust. But that's why eventually you trusted me. That's why eventually the onliners trusted me. Amen. That's why even this area, they eventually trusted me in front of a lost, dying, wicked, sinful world. Why? Because we're still street preaching. Amen. And there are like 50,000 cops who just pass by us all the time. Yep. Until... God trusts you, guess what? Other people will trust you. You don't need to deliberately show off yourself. Hey, look at me, pastor. Look what I'm doing. No, you don't gain my trust that way. You got to get God's trust first. And you know what your problem is. You need to get right with God. Every head bow and every eye shut. The altar call is open. Are you the expendable person who's going to be tossed out of the church or out of your walk? Or are you going to be the one that's going to be depended upon that, yeah, yeah, I'm going to be the person that's going to be called upon, relied upon to help out this in the church, help out that in the church, and do this and that. If not, then you're, you're expendable. You're selfish. You're thinking about yourself. You get offended so easily. You're like, well, I don't like this preaching at all. See, you're thinking about yourself, how you feel, your feelings, your thoughts, and how other people are misunderstanding you and they don't understand you. See, that's your problem. You're all to yourself. You're not steadfast. You're not faithful in the task you've been given. You're not faithful. You just slide. You just let it go. You're not consistent. You're not holding on. You're not supportive. You're not thinking about, hey, there are brothers and sisters here who are hurting. I'm not the only one that's hurting. And yeah, maybe they're a burden. Maybe they're a problem here and there. But I got to sacrifice for that brother and for that sister. I want to help him or her out. I want to prioritize the people who are ignored, the people who are isolated, people who are not there. Dependable people are spirited. They're like saying, look, I'm not just thinking about just normally helping out the church. I want to go the extra mile. Let me do more. And I, I'm, I'm so excited. I'm so excited. I want to sing louder. I want to preach better. I want to teach better. I want to help out better. I want to clean the place better. I, and another thing, the most important is you're settled. You're non-compromising. Peop, those people become dependable. I've seen it. I've seen it. Those who are settled. Those who made a dedication to the Lord. Like, look, I'm, the, uh, I'm, I'm not going to go uh, teeter-tottering. I'm not back and forth or, yeah, maybe, pastor, I can do this. No, no, I'm settled. Pastor, this is what's going to happen. I'm going to be there. Brother, sister, so-and-so, I'm going to be there. I'm going to help out in this one. They're settled. They're unwavering. And that's me. I made tons of mistakes. I revised myself so many times. But there's one thing I'm settled in. I am going to help that brother and sister. I will. It even affected my own personal life, as some of you already know, that I had to rearrange and remanage. But guess what? You know I'm settled on something. I'm going to be there for you. I want to help you. That's why you depended on me to help you. 
Are you settled? When you make a conviction, when you have a settled conviction, you become easily dependent upon. Father God, as I close in prayer, I pray that there won't be any expendables. There'll be dependable people. There'll be, there'll be dependable people here who will be a, truly a blessing to the people in the church. Can people who come to our revival meeting, Father, when they come to the blowout, can they truly depend upon the people in this church to produce them a good time, to be a blessing to them, to make everything well? Lord God, may we be set forth as a good example. When visitors, newcomers come in, can they depend upon San Jose Bible Baptist Church to be there for them, to help them? In Jesus' name I pray, amen.